So the next piece to this puzzle here is figuring out if we've got, say, a phenotype and it appears it's affected by multiple genes, but it could also be affected by multiple alleles of one gene. How do we tease that apart? How do we know if we've got an epistatic interaction or if we've got just one gene with a whole bunch of different alleles? So that's where we're bringing in this complementation test, like not complements like you're super hot. Okay, complement as in complementary to uh, each other, like our DNA strands here. Okay, so okay, we got our complementation test. So it's a test, it's functional to determine if we've got, we're gonna look at our recessive mutations, are they different alleles of the same gene or are they alleles of two different genes? <clears throat> Okay, so you take your two homozygotes, okay, two recessive homozygotes with the same mutant phenotype, and they're mated. At least you're assuming that the, that they're different. So you do a whole bunch of these because you might, if they have the same phenotype, you wouldn't quite know. So you would do a whole bunch of the uh, U and U and U and U and U and U and analyze the the offspring of these crosses, okay. And then you're going to look at the F1 generation of that cross and we're going to be able to determine whether or not the mutations, what we call complement, then we know that, ah, there are two genes, or if the mutations don't complement, then, ah, okay, that must have been the same gene. So let's grab sort of a visual illustration of this, okay? Okay, so we've got our two mutants that are showing the same phenotype and we're breeding them together. One option is that they are, um, have two different genes, okay? And let me grab my little pointer. One of these is missing one of the functional genes, okay? And the other is missing the other functional gene, but it has working copies of the other. You have these uh, true breeding, like uh, mutant pairs here, okay? Um, and there's two different genes going on. So what you would see in the offspring, when you cross those, is you would get a heterozygote. You get a, um, heterozygote for both genes. And since the heterozygote is able to make both of the um, uh, complements here, and this, this is like a multi-gene biochemical pathway, you would see the wild type coming out in the uh, offspring. The mutations are complementing each other, okay? So if you see that when you cross the two mutants, you actually do see uh, the function re reappearing again, you go, oh, okay, that must have been two genes because one mutant was deficient one way, the other mutant was deficient the other way. But since they're in this pool here, there were the, the parents could actually give a one working copy of a gene to each of the offspring. And you see this um, uh, functionality return. Okay, that was two genes. All right. Now, the opposite of this is if you do all this, okay, and when you cross these two mutants, okay, you don't end up seeing that complementation appearing. There weren't any working alleles in another gene or anything. This is just one gene that has um, uh, two different um, non-functional alleles, you go, oh, okay, you weren't able to complement that mutation. There wasn't any way that these parents could have had a working um, uh, path, biochemical pathway. Okay, these are two alleles of the same gene. Since they weren't, they weren't able to, um, they're unlike here where we did have working, uh, working genes that were just epistatically overshadowed. Here, it was just, um, that we had mutations and there wasn't any function, uh, complementary function underneath. There wasn't any apostatic anything going on here. So that's just, there's one gene. So in the complementation test, you're looking to see if there were any uh, separate genes that had functionality that would pop up in the F1 generation, okay? If they don't pop up, it was just um, two non-functional alleles, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Your book does a very good job walking through this as well. Right. So we can do this with bacteria, and when we're trying to figure out biochemical pathways in uh, bacteria. And so we've got a, uh, we can find out whether or not that gene is, is affected by something else by doing a similar complementation test. In this case, what we're doing is adding in functionality. Okay. So in this case, we've got, okay, gene A, we're curious, is this the gene that lets the bacteria grow um, and synthesize leucine? Or is gene B the one that synthesizes leucine? Well, we'll take this cell that um, 
can't grow make its own leucine and we'll put both those genes in okay. the next we're going to see can that now with the addition of that gene uh, can we grow those cells in a medium that doesn't have any leucine can it can it now gain back that function okay and so we'll see whether or not that happens and in this case for gene a hey we have added that gene in and now it can grow cool gene a is part of that leucine metabolism if we add gene b and it can't grow okay we haven't rescued the mutant defect here then that is that gene b was not part of um, the leucine metabolism so sort of a instead of a knock out knocking out genes this is called also called a knock in approach where you add a gene and see if the phenotype changes okay. so there we go there's our yep gene b can't grow unless leucine's added so it must encode for something different and so this is with a lot of um sort of modern and recent genetics is about is figuring out what genes do what and if we remove them how does the phenotype change if we add them back in how does the phenotype change okay so and the other thing we can do is if it's a mutation gene you can just take a wild type copy of the gene and add that in and see if that restores your function so you know whether or not it's a separate gene or if it's an allele of a gene much like the previous complementation test so next not all um, gene interactions are between genes but we also have interactions between genes in the environment okay so um, this gets pretty complicated uh, I'm trying to connect genotypes and phenotypes together because um, we see something like type O blood okay we've got a recessive allele a single losis and loci and we know that the inferred genotype is is that particular one okay it's pretty easy um, in that there's really nothing else affecting that gene however if we want to go the other way around if we seen it's an sequence an entire genome and then we look at a phenotype we don't know where exactly in the genome the instructions for that phenotype is we don't know if there's um, you know multiple mutations if there's multiple alleles if there's what what's going on in that direction it's much more difficult so trying to annotate a genome or trying to map a genome gets pretty tricky um, and requires a lot of computational analysis for example not all mutations are visible at all times there are mutations called conditional where the phenot hi calvin where the phenotype will only show under certain environmental conditions like um, temperature is a big one so there's a heat sensitive lethal mutation where um, heterozygotes basically are fine uh, if you have one copy of this gene you are fine as long as the temperature never goes up to 30 degrees celsius um, and you can live breed die never knowing that you have this condition but as soon as the heat goes up uh, you all die okay and so these two conditions are called there's the um, permissive condition where the mutation is not seen or not active and then you have the restrictive condition where the mutation suddenly happens or is noticeable um, in our temperature sensitive color point cats for example we also have this conditional mutation if the whole cat was um, quite cold then you would see um, expression everywhere it's only because of the temperature and body heat the change in, in body heat that you see um, the inability of that protein to function at higher body temperatures where you get the white the white fur uh, penetrance okay penetrance is that um, not every individual that has a mutation actually explains the phenotype some some do some don't um, it may not show up at all and so here are some nematodes some of which have a um, uh, blistering mutation where they have you can see little little bumpy dots on the outside mm, who wants to start nematodes under a microscope not me plant person so um, penetrance is whether or not the phenotype actually shows up about 72 percent of the time if you have the mutation uh, the worm will have a blister okay so the mutation has a penetrance of 72 percent then okay for whatever reason and so that's sort of the on off switch whether or not the it's it's shown at all in a particular individual so our penetrance is whether or not you show that mutant phenotype expressivity is whether how strong um, that that is shown so like are the blisters on our blister worms very small or very big or how many are there and sort of various phenotypic 
breakdowns, okay? So for an example, our penetrance is like, how likely are you to get in a car accident, okay? If you're text driving, texting while driving. So penetrance is, does it occur at all? And then expressivity is, how severe is the car crash? Like, um, is it just a fender bender or did you total the car, all right? So that's sort of our analogy for penetrance and expressivity. I can totally say that word like, like 10 times. Okay. Another um, sort of interaction or, or complication of our, our gene expression here is called pleiotropy. The idea that we have one gene that's doing a whole bunch of different things. Okay, uh, So the gene actually contributes to more than one phenotype, more than one process. Uh, B. catenin gene in animals, uh, which is a pretty specific example in your book, is basically it, it determines how well cells adhere to each other and also, in addition to cell adhesion, regulates this WNT signal transduction pathway. Cool, that doesn't very easy to analyze book good job uh, better example something like sickle cell anemia where um, the trait determines how resistant you are to malaria infection but also causes deformation of the red blood cells so pathogen resistance is a separate trait from cell um, cell size even though the two are related and that the shape of the cells contributes to the um, malaria resistance and another cool example is this feather frizzle chicken where you have this deformed rachis due to a keratin mutation and the chickens not only are they super adorably fluffy but they have higher abnormal body temperature their metabolic rate changes they eat more and they lay fewer eggs that's a lot of different phenotype phenotypic traits affected by one gene in your keratin okay